Nicely done, gentlemen. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much for thank being you. here. I, I mean, Nicholas, I mentioned in the introduction that you guys have been playing together since you were kids, and I suggested that uh, the passion that you seem to show would probably, it's, it's almost childlike, like it, it would not have changed from when you were young to now, the reasons for doing this. Would that be true? Yeah, yeah, totally. No, it's all, it's all based on, we started playing music because of egoistic reason. We wanted to do it because, to please ourselves, basically. And it's, uh, I mean, it's a pretty, it's such a basic thing. Like rock and roll is such a basic pleasure. You know, it doesn't really change. You're still pleasing yourselves doing yes, this. Yes, very much so. <laughs> Pelle, I've seen you guys play a few times now, and even just watching you here now, you, you have this unstoppable energy. How do you, uh, you're not a brand new band anymore. How do you keep it from feeling ritualized, from feeling like it's something that is a job that you're doing? Well, I think that it's a couple of things. I think that we... Two things. We love it and we hate when it feels like we're being bad. <laughs> you know, it's it's a pursuit of excellence and it's a fear of sucking. You know? <laughs> and in between those things, we try to like balance it on the top of the 1 to 10 scale. Do you have like somewhere personally that you dig into to, to, to bring that kind of energy each time? Or does it just come as I a fuel I think it just button? happens. Like it's, if I walk up on stage and, and the band starts playing, there's something in my mind that just clicks and it happens. And so far, so good. I'm mean, gonna keep mining it till it stops happening, basically. Nicholas, you said recently that one big difference with this album is that you no longer sound exactly the same. What's your sense of how the band has evolved musically? Well, I think we uh, we evolved from sounding more like kids to sounding more like adults in a way. But uh, I would think that we still have the sort of the the basic energy, you know, the the beast-like energy. I think is what we've always wanted to to uh, to pursue but uh, I think as far as you know you have a lion at home and it starts out young and hits puberty and you know it does what it does when it hits puberty but then after a while it becomes a full grown lion what? male you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> to extend like the, the metaphor when did you when do you feel like you became you guys hit puberty as a bed uh, we grew or have you hit it yet <laughs> grew more hair <laughs> 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 no I, uh, puberty was probably fairly early on you know we formed the band but uh, it's pretty, I would say we hit puberty and uh, pretty much by the made a Benavide Vicious record, I would say. Well, it's interesting. I just thought it was an interesting to say, thing to say that we don't sound the same because well, you're one of the bands that actually has been relatively consistent sounding uh, over over the decade that I've known you since, you know, yeah. since it was a big breakthrough. So I was curious what you meant by that. I can't remember saying it, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's probably true. <laughs> but uh, it, it does change a little bit. It's always hard to say what you know what sounds the same and what doesn't sound the same. Uh, you know, I'm sure ACDC think all their songs are unique to each other as well. But you know, I, I'm, we're really into having a band that has an identity that that is something that stands for something. Because a lot of, I feel a lot of brands and musicians want to do everything, which kind of means you're not doing anything. You know, if you're doing everything, then you haven't decided on anything. You mean to musically stamp or something? Yeah. Because it, 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 your music is still very much informed by the 50s, 60s rock and soul music, and, and you have this kind of punk and new wave ethos. Tell me what, what keeps you interested in that, some would call it a back-to-basics approach to rock. Well, I think some things, you know, some things evolve, and then they de-evolve. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is there was a time when people were very good at, say, uh, crafting with leather, and they're worse at it now. The people that are best at it are probably worse at it now than when it hit its peak. And I think that, you know, this is not... We're not nostalgic or retro in that sort of sense, but there are, you know, there are things when... I think rock music was at its best when it was still celebrating being young and having a good time and being exciting. Uh, rock and roll these days have kind of got passed through a midlife crisis and is in a sort of, you know, the autumn years depression. <laughs> <laughs> if you so, if you will. And how does that play out musically? What, what, because, what do you uh, lament about the way rock music sounds today? Then, you know, what what drew us to rock music was that it made you feel excited, it made you feel alive and happy. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of rock, the, even the sentiment lyrically, you know, from Saturday night and I just got paid till you know, I'm so sad and lonely, my parents are getting a divorce. You know, that's, those are worlds apart emotionally. Mm. And I, I guess we just liked rock and roll when it was more about the former than the latter. 
in a way, like watching you guys and listening to this record, I mean, there's the 50s and 60s thing, but you almost you even look like you've all got the leather jackets on today. You, 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 you could be a band from 1979, uh, albeit with, with a sort of uh, uh, contemporary sound but uh, t- mixed in there. But do you feel, Nicholas, at times like you're just, um, you're, you would, do you prefer that era? Do you feel like you would rather be this be 1979? No, not really, I don't think, because I think that it, uh, even though Bella's talking about the autumn years there for rock and roll, I think that it's, uh, I think rock and roll the past years, you know, maybe past 10 or 15 years has had more, maybe more room in, uh, you know, whether in, you know, late 70s people were listening to like Linda Ronstadt or something, and then there were bands like punk bands and stuff, but I'm they weren't. of the clash. Or yeah, yeah, but I mean, they weren't drawing crowds as big, uh, at least not then, you know, drawing crowds as big as they would have, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later. I think we I think we're pr- pretty fairly set. Plus it's there's a lot of music from like the 80s and the 90s that I wouldn't want to have missed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, and also, I mean I think that all the, w- also what he's kind of saying is that all those bands that now seem like legends like you know Velvet Underground, wow, yeah. you know, the Velvet Underground. Would you rather have been in the Velvet Underground? And really being in the Velvet Underground was probably a pretty miserable experience. There were 20, you know, high hippies watching you and didn't understand what the fuck you were doing. Sorry, I don't know if I can curse or not. I'm trying to avoid it. Maybe in Sweden. So so, uh, that wasn't, I I was talking about fudge. (laughs) So I think that it's, um, no, we would not rather be in 1979. We're we're perfectly content where we are. (laughs) Kelly, when the hives first came to attention in North America, a little over a decade ago, it was part of this wave of stripped down rock bands, the Strokes, the White Stripes, you've heard this. You've said that although you're grateful for the attention, the biggest thing you all had in common was your pants. Yeah. Uh, do you? Uh, that sounds sort of sarcastic. I know. I know. I know that you were saying something about fashion as well. But do you, do you really think that there wasn't much in common between these bands? Well, comparatively to everything else that was like guitar-driven music in the mainstream, stripped down, we were absolutely had something in common with each other. Yeah. But and I think we had some of the same influences, but we did something different with them. But the pants thing is that you know I think most musical movements are are connected to pants. You know, where it, whether You're it's serious like, about this. well, you know, because it's. A musical movement is is a concoction. It's based on the media perception of the music, not what the actual music is. Which is, I mean, it is showbiz, so that's the way it works. So, uh, you know, you get like bondage pants. You can you Baggy can kind shorts. of if you see a group picture and and you will look at the pants, you can kind of tell what they sound like. <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. And there's, you know, there's it's probably nothing wrong true. with that, but it's it is true. You know, and that's I think that we got lumped in together because. Here are these three rock bands in the shorts who have tight pants, and all the other rock bands have huge pants. So they must have something in common. Do you? Do you? Does it bother you that you've always that you keep that you get lumped in with the Strokes and, and with the White Stripes? Do I mean, you, I think that they're two of the be- best uh, bands to be popular in the last 15 years or something. So, now I don't really mind. You know, it'd be there are a lot of worse things to be compared to than two good rock bands. I'm, I'm just saying that we don't. We don't, we're not doing exactly the same thing. It's interesting that you should mention the pants, though, uh, mm-hmm. because you've been well-known as a stylish guy, and the whole band has been very cognizant of the look of the band, the mm-hmm. image of the band. And I'm thinking, in some ways, that flies in the face of the contemporary trend, and in, certainly in, in, in indie rock, which is just to present yourself the way you are, man. Yeah. You know, whether it's Bonnie Vare or Fleet Fox or The National, they don't, you know, they're, they're not sculpting a look. Tell me about yes, why it's... Yes, they imp- are. You think they are? Yeah, it's absolutely a very conscious look that all these bands are sculpting, which is because they do all kind of look the same. You know, it's exactly the right regular T-shirt. It's exactly the right regular shirt. You know, it's not, you know, I don't think I don't think a lot of people, if you wake up in the morning, and you know, 10,000 people are going to watch me tonight. You don't think about what you're going to wear. <laughs> you know, the only difference is we just think about it once and then we stick to it. <laughs> Whereas those, you know, most other bands will have to think every day about getting exactly the right flannel on. <laughs> Nicholas, tell me your perspective on why image has been so important to the Hives. Well, it always was to every other band that we that we ever liked. You know, it always seemed important to them, at least, like Pedro was saying, whether it be ACDC or the Ramones or you know Kraftwerk or whoever they were, you could still, you know identify them by a mile but what from what they wore or from how they looked you know i also yeah. think it's why the reason a lot of kids you know we like the fact that children like rock and roll because they're untainted by a lot of 
you know, things like taste and stuff like that that just get in the way it's of really liking the music. the same reason. <laughs> so, so I think that it's <laughs> discriminating taste, taste yeah. or peer pressure. Whereas like a three-year-old who knows a long taste it is, is, you know, because he can feel it. So I think that, and as a kid, we really got excited by bands that, you know, you want something to look exciting too, you know. And it's really the same reason as why Superman wears a costume or Batman or Spider-Man. <laughs> we wear a costume for, for exactly the same reason. You draw power from it. We draw power yeah. from it. And you want to assert that you want to make pe- pe- want people to identify that you're yeah. a superhero. Pretty much. Uh, the, I want to. I'm cognizant that I don't have a lot of time with you guys. I want to make sure we have enough time for you to play a second song. I th- you said something so fascinating, Pelly. You said that uh, in, in a recent interview, you said, "I feel like the 23 hours of the day that I'm not on stage are when I'm pretending." Yeah, pretty much. So this is to say that I mean, you've become something of a legendary frontman, you know. Uh, well, and, thank you. And your 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 nickname, Helen Pelle, is 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 apt for you. Are you saying that that's the real you? Because it doesn't seem like the guy who's sitting here right now. No, exactly. It, it doesn't. Um, that persona or whatever you want to call it doesn't work in, you know, rooms with furniture and stuff like that. You know, it's not. It, it, I would be. Um, social pariah if I run around jumping off the walls and screaming constantly. Uh, so I save it for stage, but it's really one of the only times in my life where I don't think at all, where everything is just kind of happening. And, you know, I'm in a sort of state where I'm not, you know, the rest of the day I'm like thinking, what should I eat? What should I do? What should I do? But that, you know, being on stage, that's that, that just happens. It's such a pleasure having you guys here. Thank you so much for doing Thanks this. For it's so kind of you.